Hello everyone. My name is Arfa Khanam Sherwani. I am a journalist by profession. And my job is to tell people's stories. Stories of their pain, their struggle and aspirations. But today, I'll tell you my story. So, I'll tell you why I decided to do this with my life and become a journalist. So today I'm the story and also the storyteller. Now, as a journalist, I've always believed that the poorest of our people have the first claim over us, the journalist, and over our work, our journalism. But what we've seen in the last uh, seven decades is that people who have always lived on the margins of Indian democracy have always been underrepresented, under acknowledged, or I would say unacknowledged, and almost unappreciated. But I feel that they should have, like our screens and our newspapers should be full of their stories, their faces, their anguish, their pain, their aspirations. But what we see is totally contrary to that. But first, my story. I come from a small town in Uttar Pradesh called Khurja. It's in the Bulanshahed district. Very middle class Muslim family. Six siblings. Five sisters, one brother. A very progressive family in a very conservative town. So the contradiction started very early in life. Like all other parents you see in the 80s, they wanted their daughters to become either doctors or maybe teachers. My mother was not very different. She wanted to me to be financially independent, be my own master, but, and also have a sense of service in what I do. But she wanted me to become a doctor. I had thought something different about myself. I wanted to go beyond the predictable destiny of a small town girl. I wanted to reach the moon, pluck the stars, and win the world. So this is how it all started. But there was one thing, one twist in the story that I had not realized until the age of 12, that I was all of this. I was a girl living in a small town, my progressive family, a conservative town, everything else. But I also came with an additional identity that I belonged to a religious minority group. It hit me and hit me so hard on the 6th December 1992. This is when the Babri Masjid demolition took place. Riots broke out in my small town. We all had to flee from our house to a supposed safer place. My family, we got divided into three different parts. And I literally had to run for my life. I held my few weeks old brother, he was born in October and this happened in December. I had to save my life and also his. After the riots, riots broke out, it took me several hours for our family to get reunited. And it took several weeks for us to live in a relief camp before normalcy could be reestablished in our area. There's one thing, one particular scene that I have never been able to forget of that fateful night is that when I was running away and I told you that my family was divided into three different parts, the two of us went in this direction, three of us in the other direction, rest of us in the third direction, there was this strangers, a group of men who wanted me to go to one side and they were all burqa clad women. They wanted me to go to that side and I could never understand that why do they want me to go to that side and not to this side? What do I have to do with these women? I don't know them. Why are they my people? Why they think I will be safe with them, with this side, not the other side? Which means they wanted me to belong, belong to this group. I was being told that I belong to a particular group, a particular kind of people. So I struggled with this with this whole shock and trauma for 
several years. But still, I could never understand that why this was happening to me, but not to my best friend, Vandana. Anyway, years passed by. Um, but something which could not be healed was the heart of my father. My father, who is now close to 80 now, he had left for Pakistan in the 1950s. So he did not leave in 1947. People were still leaving until 50s, and some of them even left until 60s. So I, my father only had one sister who now, who used to live in Pakistan. She he also expired like a year ago. So when she migrated, my father had no options but to go with her. So this is about 1950s. He lived there for, I think, a few months or maybe a couple of years. I don't have the exact bear of it. But then he came back to India, leaving his only sister, the only sibling, the only relative he had in this entire universe to a place that he called home. He came back to India, leaving his only sister there, crying, wailing. And she said, I will never forget you and never forgive you. And last year only she died without the brother and sister meeting for at least 35 years. They did not see each other for 35 years. My father was heartbroken. He was this very diehard secularist. And it took a toll on his health, on his business. At the age of 13, I had to begin assisting my father in his business. And I can't entirely say that it did not negatively impact my school education. Anyway, so this is the story of my childhood. The ones I would say began to heal. I graduated with science subjects, but eventually I um, opted for a journalism, postgraduate journalism course. Before even I could get the mark sheet, I packed my bags and came to Delhi with only 500 rupees in my hand. But my eyes were full of dreams, full of ambitions. When I landed here, the roads were well lit, broader roads, network of flyovers, hustle bustle, people trying to get past each other. I thought this is the place where I had always belonged. This was my natural home. This was the place where I should always have been. I felt I have finally arrived to a place where I belonged. So for the first few months, I started working in newspapers. Then finally, my ultimate calling was TV journalism. I, start, I joined Sahara TV. In a couple of years, about two years' time, NDTV was launching, and I became a part of NDTV's launch team. And uh, early 2003, I was only 22, and I was a news anchor on a national television. And this is where I thought, I had finally arrived. So that little girl who wanted a different kind of a destiny, a very unpredictable destiny for herself, I thought I had realized my dreams. But then I did not limit myself only to the studios. As I said earlier to you, that I am always interested. I've always been interested in people, their stories. I'm a very people's person. I always wanted to hear, talk, write, listen. Always that. So I started going out in the field. And again, very unpredictable. The predictable journey for me could have been that I should have been reporting about people who everybody reports about. Middle class urban people. But this is not what I chose for myself. I started reporting about people who I call the most marginalized. The farmers, the laborers, Dalits, Adivasis, religious minorities, women, youth. Which means this is majority of India. But this is why I say the majority of India is underrepresented and underappreciated, if I'm not saying unappreciated. And through them, I began to understand India and world. I wanted to understand the worldview of people which is not considered normal, mainstream, or at times even acceptable. So this is where my journey started. And I started bringing their stories to news channel, and, and I felt a sense of satisfaction then 
that the kind of violence that we have created on these people, because I believe in a functioning democracy, it is very crucial for media to tell the stories of their most marginalized people. And if you do not do that, if you reject their voices, if you reject and do not give space to their issues, then this is some kind of a violence on these people. So there was this deep sense of satisfaction that by giving them airtime, by giving them space, I was doing some justice to them. Some justice to these people who are not considered very normal. All of this was going exactly or maybe nearly the way I would have wanted or maybe some way I would not have even imagined. Then came 2008, Butler House Encounter. Butler House Encounter, I'm sure all of you know about this, that there were some Muslim men, they were holed up in a room on a third floor in a locality called Butler House. I used to live in that locality only. Some one, someone uh, just called me up, somebody who I didn't even know, he just knew me through the TV screen. And he said something like that is happening. So I was the first person to reach the venue. And I started doing live broadcast from there. And I said that there are these young men who are holed up there and police is trying to do this and that, exactly the way it should have been reported. I did not call them terrorists yet because no court of law until then declared them as terrorists. And I was trying to challenge the police's story and their version, which I feel all journalists should do. But this is not the norm. The norm is that when you see a person with a beard and a skull cap, you start calling them terrorists. And then you say the police is doing their job the way they should be doing. Even before any court of law decides on their case, on their fate, you call them a terrorist. The moment police says that these are the terrorists. There was a storm of opinions against me, not just in my newsroom, but almost all newsrooms of Indian television, that I was sympathizing with terrorists because I share their religion. I am not calling them terrorists. I am challenging police's story and how dare I do that. People who, who I used to work with, who I will eat with, will talk to them about everything under the sky they started bad-mouthing about me. Somebody would just come up to me and say, Tum simi ki member ho? Just like that, like a joke. It was just a joke. And there are things which I have never forgotten and I can never ever forget. And this is the first time ever in my life that I am documenting this experience because I come from the same industry. They're my people. I still call them my people. And I, I felt that there was this sense of betrayal but at the same time, I could never muster the courage to speak against my own people. But what happened in 2008? It changed my life forever. It made me the same 12-year-old girl who ran for her life. And people were asking her to go to that side where the burqa-wearing women were going. The people that I worked with, they were asking me to go with those women again. They were telling me that I don't belong here. I am not one of them. I am one of the burqa clad women without wearing a burqa. This is where I belong. Overnight, I felt terribly otherized. I felt um, <clears throat> I may have made it this far, but I am who I am. And I do not have a claim over the space that I call mine, the people that I call mine, the country that I call mine, the profession that gave me the power to stand there at that site, the site of the crime, and say what I wanted to say. My integrity, my objectivity, my professionalism, everything was challenged. So everything that I had earned between 2000 and 2008 I felt it was, I was at the verge of losing it. It took me several months, several years to recuperate, to heal from what had happened on, in November 2008. 
So I have nearly forget, forgotten what had happened on 6 December 2000, 1992. I did not even know what was happening. I did not know those people. But these people I knew and I felt I revisited 6 December 1992. So this is where the passion of speaking and talking to people who are different, who have been otherized, who have been brutalized, who have been denied a space and place in something that we call mainstream, this is where my passion comes from. And this may not be the perfect time to, to, to say and that the kind of India that I want for myself, especially when we are we have this whole churning around us that what kind of a country we are, who this country belongs to. Does this country belong to my father who had left a country which was being formed in the name of his religion? And he came back to the country where he thought that his grandfather, his father, five generations, ten generations were buried. He said, Mere baap ke, ki yahan hai. Main yahan se ke nahi ja sakta. This is exactly what his words were when he left his sister in Pakistan. So does this country belong to those people like my father? Or they should settle for a second class inferior citizenry because this country has otherized them forever. I would really want India, my country, to be a place where they should be free flow of ideas, of people, where technology, modernity should help us expand our dreams, expand our possibilities, and not use technology to hate and attack and troll people like me and so many millions of others who have been otherized and brutalized and further marginalized them. Even despite all of this, I still feel and I want to tell every girl who lives in a small town and in big cities that if I can be here and if there are people to hear me here, if I can make it, so every one of them, you can make it in India. India hai to mumkin hai, everything is possible in India.